Here at the Arm TechCon, and uh, who are you? Gorf Lindemann, Knock Knock Labs. Knock Knock Labs, uh, and uh, who are you? I'm Milos Meriak, Arm. And so, do you both work in the security of IoT? Uh, yes, in some sense. So, we are mostly focused on authentication and in cloud space and IoT space now. So, uh, how is authentication important for the IoT? So, you might have heard about recent attacks on video cameras where they have been misused for distributed denial of service attacks and with our technology you can make sure that there is no blank passwords, no default passwords, it's just more secure and more convenient authentication for users. How does it work if there's no password? How do you authenticate? So there's essentially two, two parts of that. The first thing, the user interacts with what we call an authenticator and then the authenticator runs a challenge response protocol, a cryptographic challenge response protocol with the IoT device itself. So is this going to work with what he's doing? Uh, yes, so like uh, just to put like some name tags on uh, the parts of the authenticator would be for example your smartphone. So instead of entering a password you have your smartphone and smartphone is basically an envoy of you and basically you can basically, uh, it's like a passport to your IoT devices and I think yeah that makes uh, IoT way more user friendly. Yeah, and, and you, you have seen different modalities supported by Authenticator. So there's a lot of smartphones supporting fingerprint sensors now. There are newer smartphones which support iris uh, recognition. And there might be uh, Authenticators built into smartphones which use speaker recognition um, in the future. So there's a lot of different choices you can make. And the good thing is that will not impact the, the size of, of the stack you have to implement in IoT devices. They can still support arbitrary modalities. So what you're doing, is this compatible with what you're doing in ARM? Yes, so I think uh, our stuff like nicely like uh, uh, complements each other. So like in order to have this uh, device identities and the security model, you need basically to store cryptographic secrets. And whatever the attacker does to the device, they should not get hold uh, of the secrets. And uh, we, with our technology, make sure that these secrets are compartmentalized. And let's say even after device is hacked, that you can still like talk to the device remotely and reset it to a known state. So last week, uh, that was it? Is it correct there was a uh, million armed devices in the US shut down the, the whole in like a part of the internet it was armed devices right uh, yes so uh, it's really important for you to f to make arm all arm super secure and are you going to succeed with this so yes yeah, so like the problem that happened is that these devices had default username uh, passwords so by having like this advanced authentication methods, you would not need a username password and that situation could not exist in the first place. So I think a large part of that story is about educating manufacturers, for example, not to ship devices with default passwords, but for example, to seek uh, alternate uh, solutions for authenticating to these devices. Who, who's, who were the hackers last week? Do you know who it was? Uh, I think it's not uh, known who the hackers were. But no, you have, you have access, right? You know, you have access to the IRC group or something? You, you uh, checked? No, but uh, <laughs> the point is like, uh, I'm not so interested about hackers because the attack itself is incredibly trivial, right? So you scan for devices of a certain manufacturer, you get a known uh, string as a response. So the point is like, internet is actually not as big as people think. So internet basically in the IPv4 space are 4 billion addresses. It turns out with a 10 gigabit uplink, you can scan literally the whole internet within five minutes. And that's basically like simply the internet is now fast enough that like everybody's dog can scan the whole of the internet within five minutes, find all these cameras and by having all the same user and password, every idiot and his dog can uh, execute this attack. Have you scanned the whole internet as part of your job? Uh, do you do that every week or something? <laughs> I have plausible deniability. Okay, but no. so, so Knock Knock Labs is a company, do you have business already doing this? Yes, we have already business and we are currently mostly focused on user to cloud authentication, right? And we have customers like NTD Docomo in Japan, which have rolled out our technology to their customer base already. And now we are bringing the same technology to Internet of Things use cases. So scale it down from big cloud services to small Internet of Things devices. It doesn't make things more complicated to install and buy and stuff? It's, is it as easy to set up? Or? Yes, it's as easy as set up and the good thing is the user verification or authentication gets much easier for the user, right? You don't have to remember all the different passwords for different devices connected to cloud service anymore to just authenticate using your preferred user verification method, which might be a fingerprint or speaker recognition or face recognition. Or so if you get you an IP camera, on part IP camera, and you get an on part uh, IP camera DVR machine, how would you authenticate it? So you 
typically those cameras do not have a direct user interface, right? There's no keyboard with the camera, there's no display directly, so you have to use your T a tablet or your smartphone or, um, uh, to, to connect to those devices. Just any smartphone, you have 10 IP cameras and, and start a Any smartphone and sure you have to register first and that needs ki some kind of initial pairing or registration process and typically what we have learned in, in devices case is that physical access to the device when the device has not been used yet right, is the right thing to do but once you have registered it's implicitly assumed to be, for example, an admin registration and then it automatically blocks further registrations without explicit permission from that initial admin. Unless you'd reset the device to the original state. So, Is this in the hardware or is it just a software solution? So, for example, the hardware can help a lot with discoverability. Mm. So, for example, by using technologies like Bluetooth Low Energy, you can literally detect devices in front of you. So you can control the transmission power of Bluetooth Low Energy devices and the smartphone then can figure out this is a device currently standing in front of. So the, the hardware can facilitate this discovery process a lot and... Uh, uh, yeah. uh, so there's ARM Trust Zone, we've seen that for a while. Uh, are people using that? Or is it they're just shipping and not really using it? And there's, there's, there could be more so security, ARM, right? So ARM Trust Zone, I think, is on pretty much... Uh, like probably most of the Android phones uh, since many, many years. It was predominantly used for DRM, uh, for example, for digital content. So let's say even, let's say, five, eight years in the past when you were playing an HD video streaming on the smartphone, most likely Amtrust Zone was involved. But uh, I think the new cases of, for example, malware detection and so on are pretty exciting. So for these, we still need to convince, for example, like large operating system vendors uh, or uh, like Google, for example, to use basically these additional capabilities of Trustzone yeah. to do more uh, than just uh, digital rights management. Uh, and this, this, I think the second, uh, let's say, largest use case for Trustzone actually is implementation of authenticators. And we have seen large companies like Samsung and Sony and so on all implementing FIDO authenticators, putting them on the devices and using Trustzone technology to protect those authenticators from the rich operating system. So you work with Trustzone? Um, we work with a lot of authenticator vendors and we have done a lot of um, proof of concept implementations which then have been used for, for real uh, deployments. So the way TrustZone works, like a lot of people are using TrustZone without being aware of it. So for example in uh, Android you have like uh, generic APIs for uh, key storage and it just happens that some of these key storages are backed by TrustZone. So you can ask basically interface if you care about TrustZone, whether something is TrustZone but I think most cases you would use Trust Zone without realizing. So let's say if you store, let's say, passwords in your browser, that storage might be protected by a Trust Zone uh, backed uh, secret. Because I really want to see passwords disappear. Is that your business? That's our oh, business. Oh, it's only so for IoT, how about for consumers also? Yes, yeah, so, so we already use that for consumers to cloud authentication. And now we are moving towards the space for consumers to IoT device authentication. So that's... Because what's the point in having all these passwords for all these websites, for all these IoT devices? <coughs> that's not secure, right? It's no. first not secure and second it's not convenient, right? So you can't remember that as a user. You, you typically forget the password. Then you come up with all these workarounds, right? You have it written down or stored in password managers or even worse, stored in some other cloud storage uh, systems which are vulnerable and, and some of them already have been attacked. So that's things you want to avoid. So you log into a registered system on the web, something on the <coughs> cloud, and that's how you authenticate all your devices? And so if you lose your phone, you can <coughs> log in again with another phone? or. So there are different kinds of uh, IoT devices. There are standalone devices, for example, light bulbs, right, or Wi-Fi routers, typically do not depend on external cloud services to work, so you can authenticate directly to those devices. But they are also connected IoT devices, for example, um, cars, right, it could be connected to a cloud service, as could be doors, right, for, for example, in hotel rooms. And if they are connected to cloud services, you register to the cloud service, right, to myrentalcar.com, for example, or to myhotel.com. You register as a user, you book your room, then you show up in the hotel, you want to skip the, uh, the check-in line, you just go straight to your room and then authenticate to that door with um, the authentication capability. So there's authentication, is there a lot of other things you're doing with the, for security? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, firmware update I think is also a big topic. Uh, so if uh, basically you have problems in IoT devices, then 
you need to make it as simple as possible to manufacture recover from them. So in that sense, uh, we need to establish uh, this common way for doing firmware updates. So you don't necessarily uh, depend on a manufacturer cooking up their own uh, firmware update and introducing, for example, uh, security problems with that in the first place. Because is that embed OS? Is that part of what it does? It provides updates? Yes. So we provide a firmware update, which uh, is portable across uh, a large set of devices. And it's basically a common way where you can have the same security assurances across devices from different manufacturers. So if you have a firmware updates, you have secure authentication, does that mean you have 100% security? No, you never have Still 100% not? security. No, you haven't fixed it since last year? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> and I will no? never fix it. Never? Never. No. Not possible? No, it's not possible. Uh, that's so. not possible. But what but, but you can do, you can work hard to make sure that the attack is so expensive for an attacker to run that it's not worth doing it. Right? And this is what we think is the way to go forward to protect against scalable attacks, to make sure that attackers cannot simply steal, let's say, hundreds of millions of passwords from servers just by avoid storing secrets on the servers or devices. So that's, that was a story where yes. uh, uh, they wouldn't really want to spend $10,000 hacking one light bulb. There's no exactly. Point. So that's the main that's case still you have the right story here. exactly yeah. it's still the story but uh, how many so, other things do you have in security you have so firmware you have authentication <clears throat> so the device identity which is an extent of authenticating the device because of course uh, devices have also relation between each other so I need to trust for example that the device that initiates an action is basically that device it's not some attacker that pretends, that pretends to be the device so I think a, a strong part of uh, uh, authentication also like identity because it's too expensive to put an, a unique ID in every CPU right that's not something they do uh, that's very common right now so they like do, uh, they don't. every modern microcontroller has a unique serial number but a unique serial number is not sufficient for device identity because the serial number once you see it you can pretend to have the same serial number and uh, it does not help so you need essentially like a method where you have some secret which is not shared by uh, the other side and Traditionally, public key cryptography is very useful for that, where you share your public key, which is uh, uh, which is your identity, but you prove to be in the possession of the private key whenever someone asks you. Which and also provides other advantages because this, this public key does not need to be the same for the device for the lifetime of the device. So if that user gives away the device to another person, you can avoid this global correlation and this, this traceability across the device owners, right, if you just replace all this, this uh, key material, which you can't typically do with a CPU serial number. So what we generally recommend is <coughs> like uh, per device edge, so basically if you have a, like multiple nodes, you have relationship between these devices, so each relationship is an edge, and for each edge you can have a different identity, so that would be the ideal case. So <coughs> let's say uh, if you have a smartphone, then, for example, identity towards a vending machine A would be a different one than to a vending machine B. So, uh, uh, basically, the vending company could not track you between these two machines. And the new Cortex M2232, <coughs> they add the trust zone and other things, uh, add security to Cortex M? Yeah, so like, <coughs> I think all modern products will contain the security features and we are constantly uh, extending the security features. But then it's also important to have a cloud, like machine learning or something. Is it what you do also to kind of like uh, find out if that device is supposed to be there or not, to identify it or...? So there's a different thing, right? So there is machine learning typically involved in the risk-based authentication, especially when you authenticate to cloud services. There's the explicit signal that the user claims I'm the, the right user and you do the cryptography to verify that it's indeed that user but then there is some back-end calculation you do on top of that which is the risk analytics um, thing and there's typically machine learning involved there. How that translates to small devices that's a different question right if those devices are connected to cloud service you can still offload that to the cloud services that machine learning but I, I'm not sure that you really <coughs> can scale down the machine learning into those small devices. Always. All right. So one interesting aspect of machine learning, <coughs> I think, in combination with uh, cloud networks, is like, can I trust the data which I use as a basis of uh, the machine learning? Because like, if an attacker, I can shift the data by pretending to uh, provide measurements. I can influence the machine learning uh, to my benefit, and like being able to trust the data created by these very small sensors, I think, is of vital importance for having reliable machine learning. And how about having uh, some kind of secure OS uh, subsystem thing? Uh, is this something happening? 
uh, the, before there was this trust zone, there was a whole second OS kind of idea where you would be a secure OS, you type your passport <coughs> in there or something. But is that something you were doing? Yeah, so like uh, the security needs to be uh, integrated with other system components. So whatever the OS is, it needs to be tightly integrated with the security functions. So for example, with respect to recoverability, with respect to firmware update. So every OS needs to perform this integration. So yes, like the OS would need to be integrated with the security functions. All right, cool. So looking forward to 100%. I, I, I want 100%. I hope you will find a way. <laughs> No, it, it's asymptotically approaching hundred yes, percent, yes. but technically Improving. we never reach hundred <laughs> percent. Cool. And uh, all these uh, IP cameras that have issues right now, what do you recommend them to do? Just return them up? Yeah, throw them into a dump. Uh, all right. <coughs> landfill. All right. Let's see if they, they can keep doing DDoS every two weeks with those. That, <laughs> there's no way to stop it, right? Uh, well, you can yeah, shut them yeah. off, right? That's so I think the, the I think the Come easiest. Up. Firmware approach update. is that uh, <coughs> the providers uh, behind these cameras uh, block that traffic so the users won't even notice that their cameras are now safe with respect to the internet so but the providers essentially need to remove uh, that threat they need to do a recall uh, no like the like you see like let's say you have a thousand users let's say here in Santa Clara with these cameras so you don't have to approach these customers but let's say the cable provider uh, that gives them internet access can detect that specific traffic and block that traffic before it hits the internet. So that would be, I think, the immediate resolution to block uh, all this uh, bad oh. traffic at the provider level and then the users don't even need to know that uh, these devices are affected in the first place. Uh, I and think that's a pragmatic solution here. And then midterm you have to update the firmware to make sure those things yeah. do not happen that easily. But again. I think that is impractical because like, you would need <coughs> to communicate to the user like who reads the mail they yeah. get from the provider, who reads like, any paper, mail. Maybe ARM should send a few engineers over to the company in Shenzhen, in China, and help them update the firmware. And maybe that's something you could think about doing now. And that arm yeah, is a little still, bit different like now, the, the company. Like after the fact, it's very hard to fix these kinds of problems, right? So like the million of devices already out there. So like whatever is now fixed at this company in Shenzhen, which probably is now aware that that is a problem and they are now aware of it, they won't make that mistake again, most likely. Uh, but still, it doesn't change that there's million devices out there and they are technically vulnerable unless the provider starts blocking the inbound access, which is the other aspect. So you stop reinfection. Uh, but also block outgoing uh, malicious traffic. And they can use Embed for the next product, right? Embed OS. Yes, so you then recommend? we would have uh, integration, for example, with uh, sophisticated authenticators, and that would remove the need for these passwords. And this is uh, hopefully something you are preparing, right? Uh, uh, Embed OS customized for that market, the uh, IP camera market, it just, it just works. So the way that works is that partners do these customizations uh, themselves, um, and uh, so it's not our business to create uh, IP cameras. Okay, okay, cool. This is a hot topic right here at ARM TechCon. What you're talking about right now is like the important thing, right? So you have a lot of discussions here with the industry, right? Yeah, looking forward to that. Cool. Yep.